Eddie, we're on. We're live. We're getting used to this. Yeah, that, that huge live studio audience out there. Yes. Now, what you do, right, is you get your, your phone out. It's called a phone. You should have been notified. It's so organized the way it just sends out every subscriber a little notification. Ah, uh, there you go. Really? Yeah. Did you get one? Uh, let me check my YouTube. And, um, yeah, you should be able to click on that and then, you know, whoever's around. Ah, uh, true. There it is right there. Yeah. So, oops, just got to turn my own volume down as it starts echoing. Um, Andrea and, I, Andrea and I did this, uh, last night, me, this morning. And, uh, we were just like, like whoever's there, just join us, you know, and, yeah. uh, Bunch of dudes just joined. Greg Heasley from South Africa. That was awesome. Excellent. Uh, John Menton. Yeah, it was great. Jerry was on. So just uh, just adds a little bit of something to the conversation. If uh, anyone is around, I haven't. Again, this is very disorganized, and um, you know, uh, I'm not expecting great things or anything. So are you are you fielding the questions as the live stream goes out? I, I wish I was that advanced. I, I have no idea how to field anything. In fact, it's probably on your YouTube page as they as they put in questions. You could just, no, nah, I don't think so, man. I don't think we have time for any of that. <coughs> happening. What Nick and I usually do, and it, let me say this as well. Uh, I will slap a little, you know, and, uh, man, what's the guy's name? Andrew Casella. No, Jeremy Casella. Um, I'll slap a little Jeremy Casella jingle on each side of this uh, when we're done. And then I'll put it on the podcast. So if you are wondering what's happening with the podcast, I haven't totally forgotten about it, but I am just trying to um, just figure out a bit more of a streamlined way to do this because streamline. Oh. What's that? Streamline. Not the pun. I don't get it. So. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> there we go. Just I guess a parallel view. So it's a little bit better. Um, yeah. And uh, what was I saying, Nick? You totally threw me, bro. Trying to streamline the process, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to basically just be able to not edit it, is the whole thing for me. I just want to be able to put it on. There it is. And this records it, it leaves it on the YouTube channel. So I wish. <coughs> get this thing to flow automatically into the podcast thing. I don't know. I haven't quite figured out how to do that. If anyone does know, please let me know. That'd be amazing. And we could just, because we do this live anywhere. There's no prep anywhere. So we might as well make it live and get it recorded and get you guys in. If you're, if you're around, um, talk to us, you know, um, you know, we're just at the moment sipping a little whiskey, drinking a little bourbon. I've got a bottle too. <laughs> Nice. All right, some vodka bottles. And uh, we're about to read some church fathers. Yeah. Great. Um, and we'll see who joins us for that. So if you didn't have any live questions, probably no one's going to turn up. It was quite a weird time to do a podcast, but uh, you're welcome. You can throw us a question. We'll try and nail that in there, and we'll probably not know the answer. But hey, join the discussion. Um, all right. So no jingle in. Because I noticed when I did that yesterday, it distorted. And I don't know how to make it not distort when you do it on YouTube Live. So I'm going to have to post edit that. So sorry, no jingle. I uh, hope that doesn't affect our theological abilities. Oh, it might, you know. It'll I get in the zone, bro. I mean, like, da 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 Yeah, that's not as good. No, that was good. <clears throat> all right. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, what are we doing today, man? We're doing... <coughs> so we're doing uh, Gregory of Nazianzus. The third, the one of three theologians of the Eastern Church. Yeah. The man who gave to us the doctrine of the procession of the Holy Spirit. Nice. Yeah. Yes. So, big gun. Big gun. He was a man who was a former philosopher and uh, rhetorician. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he was credited as being the best, basically, you know, writer of his era. Very polished. Very good. Apparently he uh, he knew Basil, so we've covered Basil already. The yep. long rules. I met him in Athens when he studied rhetoric, and, um, yeah. and so he and Basil were buddies. And uh, the, one of the the little anecdotal things is they 
they were buddies with one of the guy who became Caesar, Julian the Apostate. Right. So they were all contemporaries, the three of them, ba Basil, Gregory, and, Jul and Julius the Apostate. Wow. And uh, when Basil died, he recommended Gregory for the, uh, the bishopric. Wow. Yeah. What I found pretty encouraging as well is that um, he sucked as a pastor. So there's that. He just had a bit of a disaster of a career pastorally. Bishop, you know, going from uh, where did he go? He first had his um, presbyter role in Nazianzus, and then he uh, moved to. Uh, I think it only took off by the time he got into the bishop of the Nicene party. So, uh, and even there, he was known as the theologian, not much of a pastor. Yeah, so. he reminds me a bit of John Calvin. He's like the uh, very reticent, doesn't want to be a pastor guy, just wants to sit in a in a hole, read a book, write a book. Do theology but went into the ministry anyway yeah totally and he, i mean i think when he got into that role and the whole Aaron thing blew up i mean he was just like okay well you know this is my time to shine and you yeah, can know why so he did for the hour that role, and that's when he really started to take off and uh but he left these famous uh, orations um they are a uh, series of 45 of them that that's probably his uh claim the fame and uh, orations 27 to 31 apparently are the other ones to really look at. They are the key orations. And um, uh, well, one of the things just before we get started as well that I remember and has stuck with me from way back in the day when you start going through church history is he was the guy who um, started to think about, well, started to really push this method of, of thinking of God in terms of the, bro, your, uh, your screen's tripping out. Give it the slap of life, do it. That was the flick of death. Give it the slap. I'm getting the light. Here comes the headbutt. <laughs> oh, <one> <laughs> it's the white screen of life. <laughs> oh. oh, there we go. There we go. Got it. You got it. Oh, no. Oh, there he goes. Hey, if anyone wants to give us money, we'll buy a Nick <laughs> webcam. Yeah, that I need a webcam, bro. What is going on here, bro? I afford 10 bucks for a webcam. <laughs> <laughs> and now with yeah. the, with the lockdown you can't even go to the store and get one dude it's gone bro it's gone from white to gray bro. from rainbow colors what i'll do is i'll let uh I'll there we go all right leave it alone now man leave it alone put back touch your life <sighs> Got it. um all right now, uh, what I was going to say is just uh, started to think about God in terms of a, a negative approach. You can't say something about God, only what, what, what is not true of him. The apophatic way, the way of yeah. negation. The way of negation. And he's the guy, right? He said, well, you know, he pushed a balanced version of it anyway. I think uh, guys were, were definitely more stringent after him. But uh, he came up with, from what I remember, it's just something that was, you know, he warned against being overconfident in your theology, uh, uh, your your proper positive theology, and uh, and also he warned against not allowing for any room to say anything positive. So I thought he was pretty balanced on that from a long time ago when I looked at that. So I don't know how yeah. accurate it is necessarily, but um, there we go. That might be worth keeping in mind as we look at theological oration number two. Two. I suspect we have the same one in defense of his flight to Pontus and his return after his ordination to the priesthood with an exposition of the character of the priestly office. Is that what you've got in front of you? That's the title. That's the subtitle. <laughs> Good. We're on the same page. And so we're doing uh, paragraph four, eh? Um, paragraph four. He wants to kick off. Yeah. Fairly heavy reading. So. <clears throat> All right. Well, let me kick it off then. All right. Okay. I am unaware then that anarchy and disorder cannot be more advantageous than order and rule, either to other creatures or to men. Nay, this is true of men in the highest possible degree, because the interests at stake in their case are greater. Since it is a great thing for them, even if they fail of their highest purpose to be free from sin, to attain at least to that which is second best, restoration from sin. From sin. Since this seems right and just, it is, I take it, equally wrong and disorderly that all should wish to rule and that no one should accept it. For if all men were to shirk this office, whether it must be called a ministry or a leadership, the fair fullness of the church would be halting in the highest degree, and in fact cease to be fair. And further, where and by whom would God be worshipped among us in those mystic and elevating rites, which are our greatest and most precious privilege? 
If there were neither king, nor governor, nor priesthood, nor sacrifice, nor all those highest offices, to, those, to the loss of which, for their greatest sins, men were of old condemned in consequence of their disobedience. That's very uh, lofty speech right there. And uh, I think the basic thing that he's trying to say there is that um, I take it equally, it would be equally wrong and disorderly that all should wish to rule and that none should wish to rule. And so he's just arguing for the purpose, arguing for uh, a priesthood altogether. We need the office of a priest. Chapter, but I think we got the wrong one. Really? Yeah. What so, were you hoping for? To conceive God is difficult, but to define him in words is impossible. Nah, well, you better do the reading, bro. You gave me the wrong one. So this is chapter four, theological oration two. Is that where we're at? Yep. Well, I'm, on, I'm in theological oration two, uh, paragraph four. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know, because uh, I think people, if they want to follow us, I don't know. What are you using? I'm using the complete anti-Nicene and Nicene. Yeah, so I would have thought that would have aligned theological oration to. Oh, yep. Yeah. I don't know if there's any other way to. Yeah, so mine is uh, select orations of St. Gregory Nazianzen, sometime Archbishop of Constantinople. Oration one on Easter and his reluctance. Oration two in defense of his flight to Pontius, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And so on and so on. I do wonder... Maybe you've got the selector, right? Um, I don't know. Anyways, I'll tell you what, I'll read from this point. You can just tell me if you, if any of these are, are, are ringing a bell and then we can change from that point. Uh, what do you, uh, well, let's, let me, let me start again with, with my first uh, or fourth paragraph. Yeah. Maybe there's a way to just sync these up, but uh, listen to this. He says, um, to conceive God is difficult, but to define him in words is impossible. As one of the Greek teachers of divinity, Plato taught, his aim was to be thought to have apprehended God in that he says it is hard, uh, it is a hard thing to do, and yet to escape the charge of ignorance because of the impossibility of expressing his apprehension. Uh, but in my view, is that ringing a bell, by the way? Just uh, I've actually found another one. This is called the Great Lecture Two, Great Oration Two. Ah, there we go. Cool. So is that is that syncing up? Yep. Got uh, it. So if you're listening to this and you want to follow, where, where are they? Where are you going to so um, let me see. It's just called Great Orations. Um, so there's his orations. Yeah. And then there's, so that's actually technically it's Oration 27. Okay. Good, good call. There we go. So hopefully you can uh, use that info, find that out and, uh, read along with us if you want to because that's really all this exercise is about kind of just getting into the text um all right where was that so for that which may be conceived may perhaps be made clear by language if not fairly well at any rate imperfectly to anyone who is not quite deprived of hearing or slothful of understanding but to comprehend the whole of so great a subject as this is quite impossible and impractical not merely to the utterly careless and ignorant but even to those who are highly exalted and love god and similarly to every created nature, seeing that the darkness of this world and the thick thing, uh, sorry, and the thick covering of the flesh is an obstacle to the full understanding of the truth. I do not know whether it is the same with the higher natures and the pure intelligences, which because of their nearness to God and because they are illumined with all his light, may possibly see, if not the whole at any rate, more perfectly and distinctly than we do. Some perhaps more, some perhaps less than others in proportion to their rank. Um, all right, so I think we're just getting straight on to the apophatic uh, sort of... Yeah, the incomprehensibility of God. Right. And um, I don't see anything that I disagree with at all. No. Um, obviously, coming at it from a very, very strong like, yes. philosophical background and uh, very aware of things that... Yeah. That uh, if, if we were studying Louis Burkhoff or Bavink, it would be incomprehensible yet noble, and that would be the balancing... You know, there's the transcendent yet imminent. So, yeah. Energies, all that stuff. Yeah, good. Cool. I'll read number six. Okay, do it. Now our very eyes and the law of nature teach us that God exists and that he is the efficient and maintaining cause of all things. Our eyes, because they fall on visible objects and see them in beautiful stability and progress, immovably moving and revolving, if I may so say, natural law, because through these visible things and their order, it reasons back to their author. 
sounds like the cosmological argument right there. Right. For how could this universe have come into being or been put together unless God had called it into existence and held it together? For everyone who sees a beautifully made lute and considers the skill with which it has been fitted together and arranged, or who hears its melody would think of none but the lute maker or the lute player and would recur uh, to him in mind, though he might not know him by sight. And thus to us also is manifested that which made and moves and preserves all created things, even though he be not comprehended by the mind. And very wanting in sense is he who will not willingly go thus far in following natural proofs. But not even this, which we have fancied or formed, or which reason has sketched for us, proves the existence of a God. But if anyone has got even to some extent a comprehension of this, how is God's being to be demonstrated? Who ever reached this extremity of wisdom? Who has ever deemed worthy of so great a gift? Who has opened the mouth of his mind and drawn in the spirit, so as by him that searches all things, yea, the, de the deep thing of God, to take in God, and no longer to need progress, since he already possesses the extreme object of desire, and that to which all the social life and all the intelligence of the best men press forward. It's a, it's a great balance there, isn't it? You know, we can, through creation, we can come to a knowledge of the creator, but we can't get at his essence. No. Yeah, we can grasp his existence, but we can't grasp his essence. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. And you know what I liked about that as well? It was just such a lucid portrayal of that cosmological argument. You know, uh, you, yeah. would, you almost, you know, you get the sense sometimes the way people speak about it. It's that it's such a deep uh, buried treasure in, in, in various obscure thinkers in, in church history, but it really, that's not the way the Bible puts it. Number one, you've got Ro Romans uh, one speaking very clearly about the fact that everyone kind of does this anyway. It's the very thing that will lead to our condemnation. Uh, we all know intuitively that God exists because of, we see creation. So it's there, it's on everyone's mind. It's not some, it's not like it, it took a, a major Anselm or a this or that to work it out. Um, everyone, everyone has this on their mind, these guys too. And they demonstrate that frequently. And you can, yeah. you know, you really on your first reading, it's right there before you. It's not even something that you have to penetrate. I also, I heard some echoes of Anselm as well. None greater than which can be conceived. And you know, he talks about that extreme object of desire. There's just some, some concepts there. I'm just wondering if, you know, everyone's basically borrowing from Gregory. That's, uh, you know. Yeah. So more like Anselm's uh, giving some echoes of Gregory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, no doubt. I mean, I remember going through Augustine and just going, dude, all the stuff we attribute to Pascal, you know? Yeah. It's all August. Well, all the big stuff anyway, all the famous stuff, you know, I think therefore I am and all that, you know, you just kind of like, that's all Augustine. <laughs> so he yeah. ripped it right out of there. And, um, and so, you know, I don't think these guys intend to do that, but, but um, you know, at the end of the day, they just knew that everyone, everyone was reading these guys, the, the, the greats. Yeah. So it is helpful to see that, I think. Yeah, just very familiar, hey? Familiar territory. Wow. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. All right. So on to, uh, let's go to Biggie. Um, nine. Nine, right? Okay. Yeah. Here we go. Thus we see that God is not a body, for no inspired teacher has yet asserted or admitted such a notion, nor does the church's teaching allow it. <laughs> Nothing there remains but to conceive him as incorpor incorporeal. But if we grant this term incorporeal, it does not set before us or contain within itself God's essence any more than unbegotten, unoriginate, unchanging, incorruptible, or any other predicate used of God or in reference to him. For what effect is produced upon his being or substance by his having no beginning and being incapable of change or limitation? No, the whole question of his being is still left for further consideration and exposition by him who truly has the mind of God and is advanced in contemplation to say it is a body or it was begotten is not sufficient to present clearly to the mind, the various objects of which these predicates are used, but you must also express the subject of which you use them. If you would present the object of your thought clearly and adequately for every one of these predicates corporeal begotten mortal, may be used of a man, a cow, or a horse. In the same way, he who is eagerly pursuing the nature of the self-existent will not stop at saying what he is not, but must go beyond what he is and not, uh, sorry, what he is not and say what he is. For it is easier to take in some single point than to 
go on disowning point after point in endless detail in order both by the elimination of negatives and the assertion of positives to arrive at a comprehension of this subject. One yeah. is what God is, oh, sorry, one who states what God is not without going on to say what he is acts much in the same way as someone who is being asked how many, how many twice five make answers not two, nor three, nor four, nor five, nor 20, nor 30, nor in short, any number below 10, nor any multiple of 10, but does not answer 10, nor settle the mind of his questioner upon the firm ground of the answer. For it is much easier and more concise to show what a thing is, uh, what a thing is not from what it is, than to demonstrate what it is by stripping it of what it is not. That's a great argument. Wow. No, that's very good, isn't it? So he's basically saying it's not enough to know what God is not. We need to, we do need to go into the realm of predication. And basically that's where the scripture comes into it, isn't it? We can't predicate anything by our own investigation. We have to be told those things. And that's where the scripture must necessarily come in and be the authority for any form of predication about God. So that is quite a slam dunk on the, on the Greek Orthodox tradition at the moment, right? Because I mean, they are, I mean, they are from everything I've seen. Yes. <laughs> They're all about the mystery and all about the things we can't say. Um, yeah. And so, and I think you get get a sense of that, you know, for whatever the whatever they've attained and succeeded in by way of mystery, I mean, you really just have no idea what they affirm, you know. It, it's it's hard to get a straight answer out of them sometimes, and um, you know, even just in my brief, every now and again, I'll go through this phase. Okay, what exactly does Greek Orthodoxy believe? You know, let's try and figure this out exactly. And I always come to the the same the same spot every time. I'm like, I give up. You know, it's just impossible to get a straight answer from these. Theosis. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, uh, well, I mean, uh, leaving aside the obvious sort of things, you know, but I mean, I think that you just, uh, you know, like I, I'll never forget reading this um, White Horse Inn article as well from a, a Greek Orthodox pastor, priest, priest probably, yeah. and um, and just saying how, how actually justification could it could work. <laughs> In uh, you know, in Greek Orthodox theology, the gospel, the Protestant gospel, is yeah, you kind of work in there, you get it in, because really there's no delimiter point, there's no um, you know, ultimate yes, no, it's just as long as we can sort of put it in a certain form, you know. So uh, you know, I thought that was interesting because that means you've got some wiggle room there to to kind of actually connect with, well, you don't want to outright deny that someone in a in a Greek Orthodox setting could actually. There, there was a, a, Greek, a Greek Orthodox patriarch or bishop at around the time of the Reformation, and he was ostracized by his church because he became Reformed. So he, he came into contact with Calvinism, adopted Calvinism, and got kicked out of the Greek Orthodox Church. Well, I think to adopt Calvinism would be, yeah, I mean, I could see that. Because, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a whole lot of yeses and a whole lot of definitive, yeah, this is what we believe stuff. Um, Whereas, uh, you know, I was thinking more in terms of, uh, you know, generic, broad, sweeping affirmations, you know, um, in that, you know, I think if you, you if you talk to a Roman Catholic, for example, it's going to be hard to swing a, a Protestant doctrine of justification by by that person. You know, they're going to be, nah, I kind of know that we disagree with that. Yeah. You know, that's a fundamental point of disagreement. Whereas, uh, you know, I suppose I'd always considered that, that was the case with Greek Orthodoxy, too. And uh, maybe it is, but, you know, I think there is just a little bit more wiggle room because of this, um, this approach to theology that you, you know, it's not necessarily the point of disagreement. It's almost just lost in the sea of maybe-ness. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully uh, this is kind of relevant because uh, I've more and more, I'm actually meeting people from the Greek Orthodox camp. I think, I don't know, I think it's obviously having a bit of a resurgence at some level. I think people like the idea that they don't have to be buckled down into one you know, dogmatic category after another. They like yeah. it well with postmodernism. They like the mystery. They like the aesthetic. Um, and so, and, and a lot of them come straight from evangelical traditions, you know? So it's we've, like we've got a, we've got a Greek Orthodox church or well, Ethiopian Orthodox church in our town. And they, uh, they took, they bought a huge Presbyterian church and they transported from Egypt, the inside of one of their churches and did the inside of the church here. And there's a guy in our church who used to go there every week and uh, they would preach in Ethiopian. And he was the only non-Ethiopian there and he would have a translator sitting next to him. 
we would translate the message for him. And it's like uh, just very good conservative values, very big on family, you know, yep. against abortion, very big on, you know, keeping the traditional norms and values, very Christendom-ish. Um, oh, that was my impression from, from what he was saying. Right, but without the rigid papacy dogma almost, you know, it's just a very interesting sort of, I don't know, amicability to, to you know, just it feels to me like there should be more aggressive towards protestant doctrine but um you know it feels like there's this weird backdoor openness for it so anyways all to say that as you read this stuff it's good you know perhaps if you are talking to someone um you know who is eastern orthodox or greek orthodox or you know coptic or whatever i mean you've just got this is this is where everyone was still together so there's a way to kind of uh you know yeah this is good stuff before before all of that or, you know we all parted ways so to speak and uh, wherever we can find common ground, I think that could only be helpful. Um, but yeah, I like what he does here, though. I mean, like he he's, um, again, just just saying, listen, you can't just bubble around in an ocean of mystery. You've got to settle the mind. It's like saying, <laughs> it's like saying what is the, you know, some mathematical question and then a process of eliminate, <laughs> saying not one, not two, not three, not four, not five. Uh -huh. Let's just wait until we get to whatever the answer is. Yeah. And, your mind as he puts it never settles and i feel like that's probably the big thing that uh, the big the big appeal maybe overly so as we move towards uh more and more of a, a kind of a post enlightenment or maybe even an enlightenment mindset where you know, everyone's very uh had a, very, a great deal of confidence you read jonathan edwards for example or john gill or anyone from that period i mean they just they had figured it all out you know, and they, they were leaving nothing to mystery at that point. I mean, they had even penetrated into the deepest realms in their minds, of course, and uh, had set it out on paper. So that, that was that done, done and dusted, slam dunk. And um, and I think probably what this does is is provide the equal caution on that stuff. You know, they, they, and yet there is an appeal. It's just a, I've always found it very, very helpful thinking of a guy like Edwards, for example, or Gill. They'll go all the way there. I mean, they'll go to places we never in a million years would imagine or have the confidence to go partly because they were just more educated partly because they just you know just had a bit more just of a, smarter yeah exactly at the end of the day so they could legitimately press further into the problem but um you know you start feeling where it gets a little bit outrageous at the same time and then i always come away with a mixed feeling like at one level i'm so happy that they went there not because i, I feel like i've sort of transgressed the inner sanctum or anything but because i feel like i now know where the mystery lies exactly you know, whereas before well, you pull the mystery too, the card too quickly and, um, and something goes wrong, it short circuits the devotional element there um, mm -hmm. in, in that you, you're sort of relying on your oh so mysterious spiritual life to really, uh, you know, connect you to that profound truth. But really, we work through the brain and, um, and, yeah. and the brain is important. And it's almost like it turns into a, a sort of mythical charismatic thing. Where yeah, the whole notion of mystery can play to the postmodern assumptions, you know, epistemological skepticism. I can't know, you can't know, let's just call it a mystery and you know, let's, let's none of us be dogmatic. And that denies the fact that God has spoken and that he has spoken to be understood and that he speaks by his spirit to Christians. So the, the, you know, the through the perspicuity of scripture. Yeah. Um, so we must at least say as much as has been said. Good. And look, great, great paragraph or chapter in that regard. Yeah. Cool. You got a short little one on 11 there. You want to get 11? Well, you think it's short? Maybe yours is short. All right, let me go. Now, why have I gone into all this? Perhaps too minutely for most people to listen to, and in accordance with the present manner of discourse, which despises noble simplicity, and has introduced a crooked and intricate style, that the tree may be known by its fruits. I mean that the darkness which is at work in such teaching may be known by the obscurity of the arguments. For my purpose in doing so was not to get credit for myself, for astonishing utterances or excessive wisdom through tying knots and solving difficulties. This was the great miraculous gift of Daniel, but to make clear the point at which my argument has aimed from the first. And what was this? That the divine nature cannot be apprehended by human reason and that we cannot even represent to ourselves all its greatness. And this not out of envy for envy is far from the divine nature, which is passionless and only good, and Lord of all, especially envy of that which is the most honorable of all his creatures. But what does the word prefer to the rational and speaking creatures? 
Why, even their very existence is a proof of his supreme goodness. Nor yet is this incomprehensibility for the sake of his own glory and honor, who is full, as if his possession of his glory and majesty depended upon the impossibility of approaching him. For it is utterly sophistical and foreign to the character, I will not say of God, but of any moderately good man who has any right ideas about himself to seek his own supremacy by throwing a hindrance in the way of another. Nice. Well, much of the same thing, really. Yeah. And I just appreciate that uh, the classical notion of God being without passions is coming through there. Yeah. Um, sure. the classical theistic view. Laura, your paragraph is so much longer than mine. I got like the one sentence version. Okay, great. You get the next one then. 12? Uh, how is my 12? Yeah, I got a short 12 as well. How is your 12? My 12 is long. <laughs> All right. Um, just also, let me say, I've just right now realized I forgot to press uh, record on GarageBand. So that means you're going to get terrible sound quality for this one. Uh, if you're listening on podcast, my apologies. I got too many buttons to press these days, guys. It's just all, all this coronavirus stuff is, uh, it's like boosted the tech world by like 300 bazillion, you know, gigabytes. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> something along those lines. And, um, and I just find like, dude, I just got too many buttons to press these days. Yeah, yeah man. It's so easy. Just press record. Anyway, can you feel me, Nick? Yeah, man, for sure. It's forcing wow. us online, which is probably a good thing. It's probably, oh, there we go. It's a bit of a change of heart. Yeah. I mean, there, there, will, be, there will be some, I mean, the world's not going to be the same after this. We're going to have moved, we're going to, you know, the, the necessity will have advanced the way in which we interact online without, without meeting face to face that we're not going to be able to go back from it. And it'll have some pros and cons. Kind of like the whole world has caught up to us hanging out. Yeah. You know, it's predominantly two dimensional and online. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely something missing with online interaction. I mean, just think about when you get together with friends like two or three of you get together at church like the two of you having a conversation and the third person walks up there's a whole new dynamic that comes into play as you change your posture and you include the third person and just all of that gets lost you can't do that online like this well you know what's funny is just i mean especially if you've moved away from home you know like when we came over to new zealand um you know it was it was like a good 10 years before i saw my brother again or saw in person you know or my parents and other more than that and um and, and, you know, you think, well, you've grown up with them, you know them, you know, you know them really well, you kind of, you know, you've seen them in their adult form already. It's like, what, what's to miss kind of thing, you know, yeah. connecting every other week on, on Skype. But when I saw my brother, just the sheer like size, I mean, he's a big dude, you know, and it just threw me off. Like he was just come, like, he'd spoken all the way through, but he's just like, you know, just, just yeah. even, even just the physical reality of the size of the person you're dealing with, you know, it's just it's exactly. Just, Madness, you know um and, and uh you know i suppose that's just one of those yeah like you said i mean you, you add a third person in the mix we actually had our um uh normal sort of i would say coffee time on sunday via zoom uh, uh you know after the service oh boy totally different uh dynamic and you know i mean it just did as jerry mentioned you know you um it's like even just the fact that you'll have in a group more people than like, you'll have a whole bunch of little mini conversations going on in a group, yeah. you know? And now the fact that it, it, you can't, but have a facilitated discussion, it's not exactly. And so things like that, so everyone waits for the guy who's the lead speaker to speak. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so it'll just, you know, like you said, it'll, it'll just force us into a certain mold there and help, I think in some ways, but yeah, wow. It'll, uh, I think what it will do, um, for everyone is it'll really help us to take or, or to not take for granted those things that we've just buzzed along with well i hope so i hope people don't think this is a good a good a good move no i mean i doubt it i, I we're just not there yet maybe if you were like three-dimensional as a hologram that would be awesome i think i'd be like dude that is so cool so much better than being around. yeah the beard would be much more impressive in, in 3d the beard would be like this hologram of glory you know that'd be awesome that would be awesome. Yeah. Right. Now that's totally on point. To <laughs> well, right. 12. Over to you. Therefore, this darkness of the body has been placed between us and God, 
like the cloud of the old uh, between the Egyptians and the Hebrews, as it is impossible for a man to step over his own shadow, however fast he may move, for the shadow will always move as fast as it is being overtaken. As it is in the page as it is impossible for the eye to draw near to visible objects apart from the intervening air and light or for a fish to glide about the outside of the waters so it is quite impracticable for those who are in the body to be conversant with objects of pure thought altogether apart from bodily objects for something in our own environment is always creeping in even when the mind has most fully detached itself from the visible and collected itself uh, and is attempting to apply itself to those invisible things mm. to itself. So there you've got a strong bit of narcissism coming through. A lot well, of- I mean, it's, I, I like what he's saying in the, in the sense, I mean, this is, I think it, 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 it echoes the, the, the true observation that postmodernism is telling us that there are no neutral perspectives. We can't look at anything and especially the invisible nature of God without polluting it with our own perspective. And, and I think from that point of view, he's 100% correct. If he uses it to say that you can't know, then he's gone too far. But in saying that, you know, this should chasten us in how we know and make us more reliant upon the word. If he goes in that direction, I'm totally happy. I think one of the things I'm picking up on is the way that he, he kind of seems to be indicating, well, well, and we know, of course, it's a Cappadocian father. So he's kind of going in this direction. But hey, uh, here's the problem, guys. You just need to get away and do a little con- contemplation. And the problem is you're not far enough down the track to you know, leave <clears throat> all behind and enter into the pure light of divinity. And uh, you know, yeah. to move in that direction. And I think it's almost like you need some more beads on your rosary, buddy. You know? Yeah, if that's where he's going, then I would have to disagree. But I mean, his observations and, and his acknowledgement of the limitation of, of our ability to know. I mean, I can, I can go with him a long way there. Yeah, no, fair enough. And I, I like I like the um, application that you make there in that, yeah, it's almost like they, through a completely different channel of thought, discover what I think we now all realize is true in yeah. modernism that yeah, we, we can't just approach things entirely objectively, especially with people like God. Um, as if we yeah. have very strong draws physically and via our context. And and, uh, and it also sinks the postmodern boat because, you know, we think that, well, we've only now had this insight that there are no objective perspectives. Mm-hmm. As if people in the past never knew that. They were all absolutely blind and completely subjective and no one knew how to know anything. And we're the only ones who can know. So we can just write off everything that's ever been said and thought and done. And now we can begin to think clearly. That's just snobbery. Right, but, I mean, this is not even extending. I mean, we're not even saying that starts with um, Gregory. It's, uh, I mean, we got Plato for one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, the, the Bible and it's, you know, just as it discusses the noetic effects of the fall, you know, every Christian who knows total depravity knows that the mind has been affected, that we can't trust our own judgments. That the heart is deceitful above all things, you know? Yep. So, yeah, there's a distinct Christian um, viewpoint there. Absolutely. All right, cool. Um, th- All right, last one, 17. All, yours. All right, I'll read it. What God is in nature and essence, no man ever yet has discovered or can discover. Whether it will ever be discovered is a question which he who will may examine and decide. In my opinion, it will be discovered when that within us, which is godlike and divine, I mean our mind and reason, shall have mingled with its like, capital L. And the image shall have ascended to the archetype of which it is now the desire. And this, I think, is the solution of that vexed problem as to we shall know even we as we are known. But in our present life, all that comes to us is but a little effluence and as it were a small effulgence from a great light. So that if anyone has known God or has had the testimony of scripture to his knowledge of God, we are to understand such an one to have possessed a degree of knowledge, which gave him the appearance of being more fully enlightened than another who did not enjoy the same degree of illumination. And this relative superiority is spoken of as if it were absolute knowledge, not because it is really such, but by comparison with the power of that other. 
So yeah, he's just digging real deep into unknowability and the need for, uh, I mean, he's talking about the, the beatific vision as the time when we will truly know, and I agree. Um, I, I do feel that he is downplaying what we can know to some extent. Get a sense of the, the unmediatedness of that vision, you know? It's, yeah. It's, it's back to my previous point, you just can't. Yeah. <laughs> somewhere there um yeah i mean i i want to i want to uphold the the reformation principle of the perspicuity of scripture you know and yeah. that god is incomprehensible yet noble and you need that double balance transcendent yet imminent um and so there is a real though not exhaustive knowledge of god i don't want to go all the way with gordon clark to say that we know as god knows i'm still on the vantillian side of um you know analogical knowledge but um He's very much on, on the side of unknowable, but, you know, incomprehensible, yet he's not stressed. He's not balanced enough on the knowable side to my, to my liking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, fair enough. Um, thinking about that, I think uh, Horton to date has done the best job I've seen of just spelling this out. If you want a good intro on it, I'm not sure if he does it in these abridged uh, or redone pilgrim theology, but I know in the Christian faith that for yeah, it does a good job. Fantastic with this stuff. Um, I don't know if you feel the same way there. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And for an even simpler uh, statement of the same thing is R.C. Sproul. Anything he does on the knowledge of God, you know, he investigates the whole notion of analogical knowledge and our ability to know. Taking a solid Thomistic sort of angle. Yeah. I remember there. Yeah. Great. So that'll be good. Um, awesome. So, I mean, those are some great uh, theologians to check out. Um, I think uh, w one of the things I do want to start doing is recommending Pilgrim Theology more and more. I need to check out what's exact, what is in there because I love, you know, it's, it's just a bit more readable, I suppose, size wise. It's not this massive lug of a book that you have to, you know, traipse around with you. Um, yeah. And so, you know, just in terms of what we're doing here in two ages and two, you know, two kingdoms and whatnot, I mean, Horton really has developed all of that in, in every aspect of theology. and. Uh, it's just a great resource to look at. It's there is a book I'm thinking of uh, that, you know, if we're talking about the the knowledge of God, Matthew Barrett mm -hmm. has recently written a book. I'm just opening up my Christian audio app. I've got it here. None greater, the undomesticated attributes of God. It's cool. the best introduction to classical theism that I, the introduction that I've come across. If you want uh um, a deeper, meatier book, uh, James Dalzar's All That Is In God, is a great book. There's recently been a two-hour interview uh, with him on his book by Christ the Center. That was done just a couple of days ago. That's well worth checking out. So, yeah. Excellent. Good. Well, there we go. That is, um, that is Theological Orations. And you got a whole lot of more, more of them to read. Yeah, it was good. Eh? It was meaty. I enjoyed that. Uh, it's definitely meaty. I think that's probably the meaty. Yeah, I read something completely different on him defending the priesthood. <laughs> also cool. At least you've gone a little way down that track. Uh, good. So what's coming next is Pseudo Macarius. Do you know him? No. Oh, bro. Macarius is uh, blessed. The, yeah, exactly. The Beatitudes. Most blessed. Uh, Pseudo Macarius. Um, so 50 spiritual homilies okay you can love them absolutely so we're, we're right there in the eastern fathers aren't we yeah well uh, where would he be he'd be like i mean this guy was basically the the pre almost i don't know the guy that um yeah all, all the guys who you know i'm thinking all the second blessing sort of heritage they kind okay. of all... just makarios is greek he hasn't got a latin name so i'm, I'm thinking he's on the eastern side of things Egyptian. So, don't know. We'll have to have a look at that next week. I think he's. I remember the. So he's got. He's got some connection to the Desert Fathers. Okay. Um, yeah, but we'll have a have a closer look at that. But anyway, so um, I always tell Nick kind of a little bit ahead what we're reading. So you know, if you, I'm not sure it must be there. Might not be. This one might not be in the Anti Nicene Fathers actually. Yeah, man. I'll have a look. Pseudo Macarius, fifty spiritual homilies. If you can find it, read it. And, We'll meet this time, this place um, next week, and we'll try and live stream it as well. So join us if you get Sounds good. And if you have questions, chuck them at us through the YouTube feed, and we'll see if we can answer them if we see them. Lonely, lonely day today on the YouTube feed. No one there. 
Um, so, yeah, last time what we did was threw it on Facebook, and that kind of seemed to just help let people know we're on. I don't think yeah. anyone really gets notified unless they're already subscribed. But um, it's a sad people, sad and lonely. Look at my little teardrop, teardrop, my smiley face teardrop. <laughs> All right, cool. Very, emo very emotive. Do you want to pray us out in Latin? <laughs> come on, waiting, waiting, come on. <laughs> <laughs> there you go oh, goodness bro that you know what that sounded like COVID-19 COVID-19 <laughs> come on Nally da, 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 da. I'm gonna stop this live stream before it gets out of hand see you people thanks a million <laughs>